As we turn to open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, one thing we have asked of you and that we will continue to seek after, that we may dwell in your house all the days of our life, to gaze upon your beauty and to inquire in your temple. Hear us, O Lord, as we call to you. Be gracious to us and answer us, for you have said, seek my face, and our hearts say to you now, your face, Lord, do we seek. Please do not hide your face from us, but reveal it to us in the face of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And teach us your way, O Lord, and lead us now on a level path, for we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. If you're visiting with us, we're considering a series through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we've come to chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And we'll read these verses together and consider them. So let's pay careful attention as we read, for this is God's own word. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Thus far the reading of God's Word. May He bless it to us. Um, maybe you've considered the question before, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, Maybe some of you feel it's too late to ask that question. Uh, maybe some of you are saying, no, I can still aspire to something else when I grow up. Boys and girls, we often, people will ask you that question. Have you thought about what you want to do when you grow up? And depending on how old you are, those things begin to change. I can remember back to a time when I wanted and all my friends that I knew wanted, we all wanted to be fighter pilots. Um, the movie Top Gun had just come out, and even though my parents didn't allow me to see the movie, um, everybody was talking about it. Everybody wanted to be a fire pilot. Um, and maybe you can remember things like that in your life, where everybody wanted to do a certain thing. Um, I have a nephew who really wants to be an astronaut. We'll see if he still wants to be an astronaut when he grows up. Um, but we all think about that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, we've been asked that. We've asked people that. Um, and what if when you ask someone... What do you want to do when you grow up? They responded to you this way. I just want to live a quiet life, mind my own business, and work an ordinary nine-to-five job. Imagine you were talking to a child and they said that to you. I just want to live a quiet life. I want to mind my own business and work a good nine-to-five job you would probably pat them on the head and say, well, that's really nice. And then you would walk away and think, it's sad that child lacks no ambition, has no ambition. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? We'd all probably say there's nothing wrong with that, right? We'd all say that. And then we'd think it's too bad they don't aspire to more. Um, and that's really interesting because that's what Paul tells us we should aspire to here. That is the Christian ambition that we see Paul expressing in this passage. Um, this is what he calls the church to in just a few verses. And we want to think about that. We want to think about Christian ambition as Paul puts it here and to think about what he means by the things he says and, of course, what the Holy Spirit means, not just to those Thessalonians all that long time ago, but to us here today. Um, what is Christian ambition? What are we to seek for in this life? What is pleasing to our God? Well, Paul says it's to abound in brotherly love. It's to aspire to live quietly and to assure the world of your love. Uh, that's what we're called to as Christians. Uh, that's Christian ambition as we are to have it. Abound in brotherly love, aspire to live quietly and assure the world of your love. Uh, Paul calls on the church here to abound in brotherly love. 
We're in that section of Paul's letter where he continues to talk to the church about the ethical requirements that God has for his people. Um, He's following the same pattern that Paul usually follows, that he teaches about doctrine, what we're to believe early on in his letters, and then he talks about the implications of that doctrine. How are we to live that out in the Christian life? What does that mean? How do we put feet to it and then walk it and live it in the world? Um, And he began by these ethical teachings, teaching them about chastity, about sexual morality, um, about what we are to do as Christians in the world, and that came to them in a particular environment and was particularly important to them uh, to learn how to live, we might say, with chastity. Um, And now Paul is moving to talk about the importance of living with charity, um, how it's important not just for Christians to live chaste lives, but also to live charitable lives in all kinds of brotherly love. Um, That's what Paul calls them to at the beginning of this text, um, to brotherly love. Um, It's that Greek word that all of you know, whether you know it or not, um, the word Philadelphia. It's the city of brotherly love, um, but that's just because that's what that Greek word means. It it just means brotherly love. Um, It means a particular kind of love that you have for a blood relative. That's why it's brotherly love. It's the love you have for your family. Um, That's usually what that word is used for. And so when it's brought over into Christian circles, it means the the love you have not just for a blood relative, but for a brother and sister in Christ. Those who are not just blood relatives according to the flesh, but blood relatives in Jesus Christ, washed by the same blood, brought into the same family by the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's talking about that love that should exist between members of, of the church. And when it comes to this kind of love, the Thessalonian church is exemplary. Um, They are doing this very well. Paul says, uh, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. That's a wonderful thing for Paul to say to the church, right? About brotherly love, you don't have, you don't need anyone to write to you about that. Um, You do it as well as can be done. You do it as those who've been taught to do it by God himself. Um, And and Paul talking in this kind of way, uh, being someone who was raised in Jewish circles and educated in the Old Testament, for Paul I think that means particularly something wonderful. That that was one of the great Old Testament promises. That one day God's people would be taught by God himself. Right? That's one of the great promises we read about in Isaiah 54, 13 and 14. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. That was one of the great Old Testament hopes, that we would be taught by God Himself, that we would learn from Him how to do these things, and that promise was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that himself in John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. But that is one of the great evidences of that fulfillment, is that the Father teaches us, and we come to Christ, and we live. We live through His blood. We live according to His precepts. We flow out in love to one another. All those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ are filled with His Spirit. And he inwardly moves them not only to love his father, but to love one another. It's a wonderful thing that Paul writes to this church. You've been taught by God how to love one another. There is clearly a spirit-wrought love going on in this congregation. That's a wonderful thing for Paul to be able to say. And it's not just something that he sees in them as someone who loves them and, and is familiar with them. It's something he says is seen and known about you all over. Um, He says in verse 10, For indeed, that is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. They're not just loving their brothers and sisters locally. They're loving their brothers and sisters all over the region. Uh, They're manifesting that love to one another. And it's a wonderful thing that Paul sees in them and says about them. Um, But even though they are doing this in an exemplary manner, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't try to do it more and more. Uh, It's interesting that Paul says, you know, I have no need to write anything to you about this because you're doing it so well, and then he writes to them about it to do it more, right? Um, You have no need to write to anyone, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. 
Um, and again, this is such an important reminder. It, it echoes what he had begun saying in the beginning of chapter 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is a reminder that you can never rest on your laurels in the Christian life. Um, no matter how well we are doing in the Christian life, there is always room to improve, um, room to do more. That's the general call that he began with this chapter. That's the specific call when it comes to brotherly love. How we love one another, we can do that better. Uh, there's no church that can say, we've arrived. We don't need to work any harder at this. Uh, we love one another well. We can turn to something else. We've got this aspect of it. Um, and that's an important reminder about the church, that we need constant reminders to do what God is calling us to do, not just in the areas where we need improvement. Right? I think all of us know those areas where we need improvement. Probably every Sunday when we read the law, there are things as we read them that you say, you know, that one I'm not so worried about. But yeah, that one hits me right where I live. That's what I need to work on. Um, but this is a reminder we need to work on all those aspects of it, not just the ones we, we know where we have problems, but even the ones we think we're doing pretty well. And that's the, that's the business of the church. That's what Paul is doing. That's what God's Word has to continue to do to us, to continue to equip us, to continue to build us up as the body of Christ. Because we need to continue to work until we've arrived. Until we've arrived at the goal that God has set for us. That goal that's expressed in Ephesians 4.13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Uh, that's when we can stop working. When we've reached the, the stature of Jesus Christ in all of His fullness. Uh, then we can stop trying to improve. Then we can stop trying to do better. And if we think about it that way, we know what the truth is then, right? That we, we can't ever then stop in this life. We won't reach that finish line until after this life when we reach that perfection. So we always will need work in all areas of life. Um, you can think about it like a well-tended garden. Um, I don't tend gardens. I kill things that are green. Um, but I know there are people who do tend gardens well. Um, and those who, who take the time to work in a garden, make it work well, know that you can't establish your garden and then all of a sudden just turn around and say, now it's fixed, now it's established, now it'll it'll garden itself. No, it, it needs continuing attention. It needs continuing work. The Christian life is like that. Uh, we need to continue to tend our lives, continue to work on those things, because we can always perfect them, and sometimes the things even that we're doing well need fine-tuning to do better. I think that's why Paul is writing these things to a church that loves really well. Um, because I think there is almost a sense in which he's saying, and sometimes you love one another too well. Sometimes you love one another too well. Now we might think, is that anything any church ever really needs to hear? that you love each other too well? Um, and I think in this case they are, because I think some Christians in, in the Thessalonian church were presuming too much on the love of their brothers and sisters, um, particularly as it came to not providing for themselves, but trusting that their brothers and sisters would provide for them. There seems to be going on in the Thessalonian church an undue excitement about the end times, that's why I think Paul will go from talking about brotherly love to talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there are some people who are obsessed with the end times in the church and that their, their obsession with the end times has caused a certain amount of restlessness in their lives. They've been distracted from the ordinary business of life and been so taken up with thinking about the return of Jesus Christ that instead of living in this world, in this life, they were living with a total focus on the world to come and not paying attention to their lives in this world. Um, and as they were doing their own things, instead of working regular jobs and being busy with all kinds of end times excitement, 
They were becoming lazy. They were depending on the church to provide for them. And they were becoming busybodies in the church. Um, and I think Paul is saying, in a sense, you love one another, and that's a good thing. But some of these people you're loving too much. That as they become busybodies in the church, you're tolerating that. Um, and out of your great love, you're supporting people who aren't supporting themselves, and you're loving them. Um, but you need to be loving in all the right ways, not in loving these people too much and allowing them to be idle, restless, busybodies who depend too much on their brothers and sisters and aren't showing brotherly love themselves. Because God has not just called us to sit around waiting for Jesus to return. He's given us lives to live. And so Paul is saying you need to show the right kind of brotherly love. Not just love one another, um, but aspire to live the kinds of godly lives that God wants you to live. Not being idle, not being busybodies, but rather to be quiet, industrious people who tend to their own business in life. That's why the second thing he says to them is that they are to aspire to live quietly. They are to aspire to live quietly. Um, it would have been a kind of shocking thing for Paul to say what he says in verse 11. To aspire to live quietly. That maybe doesn't strike us as a shocking thing to say. Um, it's, it's one of those commands the Bible gives that might come to our ear as kind of innocuous commands. Sure, that's probably a good thing to aspire to live quietly. Um, could ask for more quiet right now. Um, you know, quiet is something that's a good thing from time to time. Um, we, we should aspire to live quietly. That doesn't strike us the way it would have struck their ears. Because what Paul says here is really a kind of oxymoronic statement. That's how they would have taken it. Now, boys and girls, oxymoron is not an insult. And you shouldn't call your brother or sister that. Uh, what, what is oxymoron? What, is that, what does that mean? Well, it's an expression when we talk about two words or ideas that don't go together. Right? Things that seem to be natural opposites. If someone talks about a living death or a sour sweetness, um, or the joke is always, right, a jumbo shrimp. Um, they're two words that don't fit together right? The, those things don't fit together. Living death doesn't fit together. A sour sweetness that doesn't fit together. Um, and what Paul is saying here wouldn't have sounded to them like things that fit together. Because that word he uses for aspiration, to aspire, um, it, it kind of has a sense of strive strenuously for something. Strive strenuously for something. And then you say, okay, Paul, what am I to strive strenuously for? He says, strive strenuously to be still. Strive strenuously, strenuously to be still. Almost like he's saying, be ambitious to be unambitious. Strive to be quiet. Um, what does Paul mean by that? It's meaning aim for a peaceful life. So that when the Lord returns, he finds you doing the ordinary steady service that he has given you to do. Yes, the Lord is coming soon. Yes, His coming will change everything. But how are we to live until He comes? Not running around like chickens with our heads cut off, but doing the things that He's given us to do. You know, Martin Luther kind of captured this. You've probably heard this before when someone asked him, if you knew the Lord was returning tomorrow, what would you do today? And he said, I'd plant a tree. I would do the ordinary kinds of things I would do today if I knew the Lord was coming. I would do the things that are normally to do. He's called us to live the lives that He's given to us. We don't have to run around trying to figure out what we are to do. And there's a comfort in that. That whatever God has called us to do, that's what we're called to do. That's how we're to live our lives. That's how we serve our God to mind our own business, and to work with our own hands. Right? He's saying rather than being idle and being a busybody, running around concerning yourself with all kinds of things that are not your business, 
Concern yourself with the business God has given you. And don't meddle in the affairs of other people. I like how the New Testament commentator F.F. F. Bruce put it. There is a great difference between the Christian duty of putting the interests of others before one's own and the busybody's compulsive itch to put other people right. I love that. The busybody's compulsive itch to put other people right. Um, maybe if you're on social media, you've felt that itch. Someone says something and you think, I have to comment about that. I have to respond to that. I can't just let that stand. And I think what we're experiencing then is that, that busybody itch. I've got to get myself involved in this. Actually, no, you don't. Right? There, there's, far mu- there's plenty to do in your own life of the things that God has called you to do. That we don't need to be busy in other people's business. Right? There's plenty we can do in our own lives. Um, and we should mind our own business. Right? And, and, and Paul doesn't mean that in sort of a snotty way. He just says, every one of us has been given a calling. In our work, in our family, in our church, we all have a calling. We all have plenty to do of our own, in our own lives. And we're always complaining that we don't have time. We have all these time-saving devices, but we have no time. Um, maybe it's because we're being too busy with other people's business and not enough with our own. Paul says, mind your own business. He says, work with your own hands. That also would have, would have hit the Greek ear in, a, in an odd way. Um, because it would be sounding like Paul is saying that you should do things that are beneath you. Work with your own hands. That has the connotations of manual labor. And there's nothing wrong with manual labor, but back then when they would have heard that, they would have said, well, that's not what we aspire to. That's not what we're hoping our kids will go out and do. In fact, they would have thought, you know, a lot of that is slaves' work. Working with your own hands? Um, That was kind of the Greek attitude. Manual labor is beneath me. That's slave work. I'd rather be unemployed than do that. Um, and even some slaves who've been, who'd been set free or earned their freedom would refuse to go back to doing that kind of work. So this too would have been a kind of shocking thing. But what Paul wants them to understand is all kinds of true work are things that Christians can do without any shame. Good work is honest, useful employment, and any kind of honest, useful employment should not be seen as being beneath us. Um, Paul, I think, is talking to a church where some people felt like these things were beneath them. I can't do that. That's beneath me. Um, and, And Paul brings that instruction not just as someone opining about the usefulness of that. Um, opining about, you know, how great agrarian farm life is as someone who has no dirt under their fingernails, who doesn't really know, um, who's romanticizing something that's tough. No, Paul worked with his hands. He worked with his hands among them, right? He was a tent maker. He worked in making tents and working in leather. He worked with his hands. And if any Christian thinks that that kind of honest employment would be Beneath them, think of our Lord Jesus Christ who grew up a carpenter. Right? Paul's saying we have to have the right attitude about work. Honest employment, useful employment should never be seen as beneath us. And here too, I think Paul is speaking to that problem that was going on in the Thessalonian church, that they loved one another so well that even those who could work and weren't working were being supported by the church. And Paul is saying that shouldn't be. People who can earn their own living shouldn't be living off the church and then being busybodies everywhere else. He's saying if you can work with your own hands, you should be working with your own hands for the sake of your brothers and sisters so that they don't have to support you. And Paul is reminding them that this is not just, you know, economics according to Paul some preacher's idea about how things should work in the world, but he says what in verse 11? As we instructed you, 
as those who are th- those sent by the Lord to instruct them. Right? That, that, I think, is tying back to verse 2 where he said, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. These are not just Paul's opinions about things. These are the instructions given to him as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word for instruction is a military command, a court order. They're marching orders from our Lord to aspire to live quietly, to work with our own hands, and to assure the world of our love. That's how we see the servant's life in action. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ taught us to show love, to not think that things are beneath us for the sake of our neighbor, uh, but to do all things to serve them. That's why Jesus came into the world. Right, Mark 10, 45, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. And here we find the King of glory in the New Testament washing feet, right, doing the work of a slave, working with his hands for the sake of his brothers. And said in John 13, 13 through 15, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. If the King of Glory became a servant to his brothers because of his great love for them, how can any of us say that anything is too low for us to do beneath us if it's work that we can accomplish not just for God's glory but for the good of our brothers and sisters? We express love for one another when we make it our ambition to do our own work and to mind our own business and to quietly go about the business the Lord has given us to do. That kind of life helps to assure the world of our love. That's the last thing we see in this passage. Paul reminds the Thessalonian church that the world is watching them. The world is watching them. Now, why is Paul giving them these instructions? Well, in verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul says it's important that we give a good witness in the world. Um, He says particularly about one another. We want to behave as good brothers and sisters to one another. We've we've covered that as we've gone on. There will always be time Christians want to work and can't find it. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about being idle. Um, And if this is ignored, we end up with the things the way they were in Thessalonica with some people working hard to show love to others and others running around being idle busybodies. That's not good. That's a burden on the church, not a help. So Paul wants them to behave as good brothers and sisters towards one another, but he says we also need to be good witnesses in the world. We also need to be good witnesses in the world. We want to walk in such a way as to give a good witness to the gospel. As one person put it, to adorn the gospel with our lives. That's how we want to live, that we might adorn the gospel with our lives. The gospel is already scandalous enough in the world, right? The the cross of Jesus Christ is already scandalous enough in the world. The call to pick up your cross, deny yourself, follow Jesus, and lose your life to find it is a hard enough message to bring to the world without us adding unnecessary scandal to it. That's, I think, what Paul means here. If if that's what the world sees of us, that we're idle, that we're living off others, that we're running around as busybodies, what will it think of us? What will it think of Christ if we're seen to be that kind of people? We don't want the world to see us as do-nothings who need everything given to us. What do we want the world to see from the church? We want it to see what Christ has meant us to be. A blessing to those who are around us. Profitable members of society who live lives that draw people to Christ. 
when the world sees the way we love one another, it adorns the gospel we preach with beauty. It causes people to want to come to this God who builds this church. And hopefully God will use that love to draw the lost to Himself. That people will see how we love one another and want to be part of that. That should be our ambition. That should be our ambition in this world. To grow in brotherly love to live quiet and productive lives, to witness to the glory of the love of Jesus Christ in a dark and dying world. And may that be true of us. May the Lord, by His Spirit, help us to increase in brotherly love here and amongst all our brothers and sisters throughout the world to His glory and for the good of our neighbors. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this reminder of what we should aspire to as Christians in the world. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to grow in brotherly love, that we would show that affection to one another that we ought to, that we would not involve ourselves in business that's not our own and scratch that itch of running around involving ourselves in other people's business. But give us a quietness and a contentment. Thank you for the various callings that you've given to us. Uh, callings in our, in our family lives, in our individual lives, in our, in our church life, in our occupations. Lord, help us to avoid a kind of restlessness in this life, but to be thankful for the things that you've given us to do and to do them well to your glory and for the good of our neighbors. Help us to aspire to live quiet lives. Help us to love one another. Help us to adorn the gospel with those kinds of lives so our neighbors might see our good deeds and glorify you in the day of Christ's visitation, but also that by our good deeds our neighbors might be won over to Christ, that we would have a good reputation with outsiders. Lord, help us to do this more and more by your Spirit. Help us to glorify you in gratitude for the great things that have been done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And hear us, we pray in his name. Amen.